In the words of David Chalmers, the hard problem of consciousness is the problem of experience. When we think and perceive, there is a whir of information processing, but there is also a subjective aspect. As Nagel has put it, there is something it is like to be a conscious organism. This subjective aspect is experience. When we see, for example, we experience visual sensations, the felt quality of redness, the experience of dark and light, the quality of depth in a visual field. What unites all of these states is that there is something it is like to be in them, All of them are states of experience. Debating the question, can science explain consciousness today, is Philip Goff and David Papineau. Philip Goff is an associate professor in philosophy at Central European University in Budapest. Goff's main research focuses on trying to explain how the brain produces consciousness. In short, Goff thinks that we need to radically rethink our understanding of matter in order to explain consciousness in something like the way Einstein radically rethought the nature of space and time. David Papineau is a professor of philosophy at King's College London and the City University of New York Graduate Centre. Papineau is an accomplished philosopher in metaphysics, epistemology and the philosophy of science, mind and mathematics. In relation to our question today, Papineau is a defender of the a posteriori physicalist solution to the mind-body problem. Links to all of Goff's and Papineau's works can be found on our website, thepansycast.com. This fascinating debate was recorded at the University of Liverpool London campus. Thank you to all of the staff at the University of Liverpool London and thank you to Philip Goff and David Papineau for taking part in today's debate. Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Pan Psycast. I'm Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello. Mr. Gregory Miller from episode 19 and the University of Liverpool. Hello. Associate Professor in Philosophy at Central European University in Budapest, Philip Goff. Hello. And Professor of Philosophy at King's College London and City University New York Graduate Centre, David Papineau. Hello. To begin with then, we're going to start off with a couple of quick definitions. Philip, would you like to explain to us what consciousness means? Yeah, I think the word consciousness is a little bit ambiguous. I think often in popular discourse, people use it to mean something quite cognitively sophisticated, like self-consciousness, the awareness of self, something we might perhaps be reluctant to ascribe to non-human animals or babies. But um, the the way it's generally defined in philosophy, and I think the way we're going to use it today, the word consciousness just just means experience. So feelings, sensations, visual and auditory experiences. So the kind of thing, you know, we certainly wouldn't be reluctant or most of us to ascribe to a chicken, for example. So we wouldn't maybe wouldn't think a chicken is self-aware, but we certainly think a chicken Maybe its experience is not as rich and complex as a human being, but it has some kind of sensory aware, sensory experience of the, of the world around it. In contrast to, say, a rock, at least commonsensically, we tend to assume that a rock has no experience, no inner life, and in, in this sense differs from uh, the chicken and the human being. So, so this is all we mean by consciousness, simply the property of having experience. Perfect. Thank you very much. And David, could you please ex- explain to us what is meant by the hard problem of consciousness? Ah, oh, the, the hard problem. Good. Uh, perhaps I'll start by, by taking issue with the uh, quotation from David Chalmers that Jack uh, began the introduction with. And if you look at that, that just says, well, it says the hard problem is the problem of experience, but then just goes on to say, following uh, what Philip said, that uh, in the world there are experiences. There are some states that it's something that it's like to be in. There are visual experiences, there's pains. Uh, we take it humans and probably most other animals have such experiences. Stones don't, and that's what experience is. But it's not quite clear why that's a problem yet, just to say the hard problem is the existence of experience. Why is that a problem? Uh, 
everybody in this debate, I think, accepts that there's experience, that there's states, that it's something that it's like to be in mm. for the beings that have them. I think we have to have to bring in something else to understand why this might be a problem. Now, uh, I have some ideas about why it's a problem, why it poses a problem. But I can see Philip's uh, slightly itching to get in here. Uh, no, do, no, do, do, do you disagree just, with what I've um, said so far? Well, just the, the claim that everyone accepts as experience. I think there are some radical physicalists, Daniel Dennett or Keith Frankish, for example, who might just deny there is experience because perhaps they... Perhaps they think the hard problem is too hard. But anyway, just a little ad. I, that was the only point. In That's a little you uh, side point. I don't think you want yeah, to pause on that, that too much. No. Anybody who's interested, uh, next week's Times Literary Supplement, which I think will be August the, the 4th, has uh, an exchange between me and Dan Dennett no. on, on just this question. And I say, Dan... Why, why are you so strange as to deny that there's consciousness? Surely everybody has right. to admit that. So uh, anyway, that's, that's a little, little digression. Uh, everybody apart from Dan Dennett and Keith Frankish uh, in this debate accepts that there is consciousness, that there are experiences. And I think the hard problem is understanding how they fit into the rest of the world, how they relate to other mm. kinds of states. That's where the problem comes. It's not just existence of experience. Everybody accepts that. But then there's a the question of how experiences relate to other goings on in the world. And then we get a lot of differences between different, different philosophers. So I think the hard problem really gets interesting because there are these philosophical arguments which purport to show that physical science can't possibly account for the existence of, of conscious experience. So this is, this is the, what really motivates the, the core of the hard problem. So it's sometimes a little bit frustrating, I find, in, uh, in popular discourse where people talk about the hard problem and maybe give their solution, and, but they just stick at that superficial level. They don't, they don't offer any, sort of, any response to these arguments that, that try to show that you know, physical science cannot account for consciousness. I mean, maybe those arguments are rubbish, maybe there's a response to them, but, you know, you, you have to you have to respond to those to those arguments. So I'm I'm not quite sure why at this stage we're asking physical science to explain consciousness. I, I kind of feel you might have got a bit ahead of ourselves here, because after all the the orthodox view, historically speaking, going back to Descartes, and I'd say for most scientifically informed thinkers until fairly recently was that there were two kinds of things in the universe. There was physical stuff, uh, atoms, molecules, stars, and so on, and conscious stuff, mind stuff. And these were just two separate uh, uh, constituents of the universe, and they interacted causally. This is the, the dualist, interactive, dualist view. And from that mm -hmm. perspective, there's no demand for physical science to explain consciousness. Consciousness mm -hmm. is just another another kind of stuff in the universe alongside the physical stuff. Sure, yeah, I think that's a good point. So if you're happy to be a dualist, you know, dualism being the view that mind and matter are fundamentally different kinds of thing, the view of Descartes, then in a way you, you avoid the hard problem altogether. I mean, you, you, you're not worried about these arguments that purport to show that physical science can't account for consciousness you, because you think, well, of course it can't because... Uh, the soul is not a, is not a physical entity, so so that's right. I mean, if you, you're not going to be worried by these arguments, in fact, those arguments might no doubt motivate you to be a dualist for precisely that reason. Um, I suppose, like many philosophers, I find dualism quite unattractive. I mean, just on the face of it, it seems a quite inelegant, disunified, unparsimonious picture of nature. Um, and of course, there's also the, the classic problem of of how mind and matter interact causally, which which I think you've written a few things on. <laughs> I guess that's that, that's a that's a not, common common point between us. Not yeah. really. I don't no. have any problem about mind and matter interacting. If I was a philosopher in between uh, mm -hmm. 1650 and 1850 at least, I would have said that's perfectly straightforward. I mean, there's there's mental stuff and there's uh, physical stuff and they, they interact somewhere in the brain, no doubt, mm -hmm. where, the, where the mental stuff influences uh, the motions of our bodies and what's the 
what's the problem? I, I, I think the problem that's put pressure on dualism is a much more specific and, and recent one, which is that physical science seems to have produced evidence that there aren't any uh, influences on the motion of matter apart from a few fundamental forces mm. uh, right. recognized by fundamental physics. And that seems to squeeze out a separate mind from the class of things that influence the motions of our of matter and right. our bodies in particular. And that's why why dualists nowadays are kind of pushed into the rather unpleasant position of being epiphenomenalists. And given that that's such a nasty and uh, really in the end untenable position, now we have the problem, okay, of given uh, that dualism is out, how are we to conceive of the connection between mm. The material world <clears throat> that seems to uh, exhaust the, the causal realm and the experiential world that we know about directly from our own experience. Right. So there's no a priori problem with mind and matter interacting. Absolutely. It's more that if we have empirical grounds for thinking that the physical world is a sort of closed causal system with uh, no influence from outside of it, then... This gives this gives us problems. This then gives us problems explaining how, how how the mind's influence can fit into that picture, right? Just before we jump into part one, can you clarify what epiphenomenal is for the listener, please? Uh, all right. So here's a picture, which is quite a common picture. As I said, people get pushed into this position once they accept that the the physical realm is causally sufficient unto itself. Uh, all physical effects can be fully accounted for by physical causes. In particular, the movements of our bodies can be fully accounted for by the operation of neurons in our brain, and that can be accounted for by prior physical processes. Then how does a separate dualistically conceived mind uh, relate to all that and the standard picture you get pushed into is it's a bit like the puffs of smoke on a train. Here's the train going along, all the physical processes causing each other sufficient unto themselves, and every so often a uh, puff of smoke comes up, the brain kind of generates uh, a feeling, but the feeling doesn't have any independent uh, influence on the motion of the train. So that's the epiphenomenalist picture. The, the feelings are like puffs of smoke, uh, relative to the operations of the brain. Thank you. Yeah, so I think at this point we, we're in agreement. Uh, we both think conscious experience exists, that it needs to be accommodated somehow in our overall picture of the universe, and we're both unhappy with dualism. So, so that does raise the challenge of, well, if you're not a dualist, how does consciousness fit into the physical world? And so at this stage, I think we're, we're both pretty much agreed on the problem although I guess we'll pretty quickly disagree on the solution. Part one, open debate and discussion. Okay, so the first question then, I think we might begin with, David, is what is physicalism? I suppose physicalism uh, in this context is one answer to the problem we've raised. How does, how does uh, consciousness fit in, especially given the, the causal closure of the physical? The physical realm seems to be causally sufficient unto itself. And the answer I favor, along with a good number of other, other philosophers, is that the solution to the puzzle is to recognize that conscious processes just are one and the same as physical processes. When I have a certain visual experience, experience as of seeing a red surface, that's just one and the same as certain neural oscillations in a certain area V4 of my visual cortex. So that solves the problem of how conscious experience get into the physical world and have physical effects. They just are one and the same as physical processes. So that's, that's a physicalist view of consciousness. 
Yeah, so I think physicalism starts to run into problems and we get to what philosophers call phenomenal qualities. So this is just a technical term that just means the qualities we encounter in our experience, the, the redness of a red experience, the itchiness of an itch, the sensation of spiciness. Um, and I think the trouble is that there are pretty powerful philosophical arguments that purport to show that physical science just can't can't account for these qualities. So I guess, I mean, I guess the, the, the starting point would be the, the knowledge argument. And I know, so I know you've, you know, in a previous podcast, you, you've looked at the knowledge argument, but I've been, I've been thinking recently that the, maybe the knowledge argument is a little more exotic than it needs to be. <laughs> so, you know, all this story about Black and White Mary and... Um, and, uh, you know, it's sort of sci-fi, a bit hard to get your head around. I mean, I think one one more straightforward way of just putting the basic point is just to think of a congenitally blind neuroscientist, you know, sort of a neuroscientist who's been blind from birth. And it's pretty intuitive that such a neuroscientist will never know what it's like to see red, right? No matter how much neuroscience uh, they, they, they read, they're never going to know what it's like to see red. You have to actually experience red to know what it's like to see red. So that I mean that's that's the starting point. So what 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 follows from that? I think it follows that that the that the language, the vocabulary of neurosciences or physical science more generally just can't fully describe, fully characterize those phenomenal qualities. Can't characterize for example what what it's like to see red. Because if it could then uh, your, your congenitally blind neuroscientist would be able to read the neuroscience and know what it's like to see red, which, which they clearly can't. So, so I think that what this shows is that the, the, the language of neuroscience cannot describe, cannot characterize the phenomenal qualities. And if it can't even characterize them, then it certainly can't explain them, right? If, if a neuroscientific theory was going to be able to explain the phenomenal qualities, it would have to fully characterize them and then explain them in more in terms of more fundamental brain processes but if it can't even can't even describe them in the first place then it certainly can't explain them so that's the i mean the, the, the debates get very complex but i think that's the starting point to start to see why physicalism runs into trouble when it gets to the phenomenal qualities okay but i don't think you're being fair to the physical position i Indoors. Mm. After all, a, a physicalist like me is going to admit from the start that it's a discovery that conscious processes like an itch or having an experience of a red surface uh, are one and the same as brain mm. processes. It's not something that, that we know straight off. It's something right. that we need science and investigation to find out. So from the physicalist point of view, these identities between conscious mental processes and brain processes are like everyday discoveries based on evidence, such as that Superman turns out to be Clark Kent or water turns out to be H2O. Right. So looking at it like that, well, then it's not surprising that a blind neuroscientist or somebody who is only thinking of these matters in physical mm. terms is going to be deficient in a certain sense. They aren't going to be thinking in terms of the everyday concept of seeing something red or feeling right. a pain. They're just going to be thinking in terms of the neuroscientific stuff. But the fact that there's two ways of thinking about this mental mental state and certain people might only have one of them doesn't show that the two ways of thinking don't refer to the same thing mm. so you may as well argue look somebody who only knows about Clark Kent and has never heard of Superman uh, won't be able even to raise the question of whether Clark Kent is the same as Superman because they haven't got the concept of Superman. Well, maybe so, but that doesn't show that Clark Kent and Superman aren't just the same person and that somebody who does have both concepts will do well to recognize that they refer to the same thing. Right, but I mean, there is a, there is a difference, isn't there? Because um, 
your congenitally blind physical scientist can easy can learn the chemistry and 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 would be able to deduce that water is h2o or these other empirical identities that heat is molecular motion um but arguably the the congenitally blind neuroscientist no matter how much physical science they learn will never be able to know what it's like to see red so no matter how much physical science they learn there's a, there's there's a fact there they're missing out on so that does seem a disanalogy to the to these other these other empirical identities you're drawing our attention to i think there's two two thoughts in there let me let me just address one of them as i see it uh one of our ways of thinking about experiences like seeing something red or feeling a pain so we have these two ways we think about the experience in terms of what it's like we imagine how it feels or we think of the experience i say in terms of thinking about certain neural processes oscillations in v v4 now i think the first way of thinking about this state thinking about it as it's sometimes technically called phenomenally is tied to actually having the experience so mm. when you get to be able to think about the experience as it were internally in terms of what it's like it's as a result of previously having had the experience and then recreating an imagination and thinking about it that way now of course somebody who's been blind from birth will not ever be able to acquire that kind of concept of a visual experience but that's just to do with the fact that they never actually had those visual experiences there's nothing to show that somebody who has had those visual experiences and can think about them in terms of what they're like isn't then thinking about just the same thing as goes on uh, in the visual cortex. Right. So this is an example of what's become known, I guess, as the phenomenal concept strategy. So, you you know, it's, it seems that these phenomenal qualities are very peculiar and very different to physical properties. And um, the phenomenal concept strategist says... No, it's not. It's not the properties themselves, the phenomenal quality on the one hand and the brain state on the other, that are that are weird, that are different. It's the concepts. So we ex we ex or to put it another way, we explain the weirdness of consciousness not in terms of consciousness itself, but in terms of our concepts. These funny kind of concepts we use to think about it, and so and so that's the response to the knowledge argument. Exactly. Guess, that, uh, two that two two words for one thing. The congenitally As brain congenitally blind neuroscientist lacks what they're lacking is is this kind of funny concept that you can only have through yeah so i mean there's the, 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 there's an interesting debate to be had here i so I, I suppose it's important to distinguish between more radical and more moderate physicalists you know your more m radical physicalist like daniel dennett who we've already raised might just say there just aren't phenomenal qualities they're just they're just an illusion they they don't really exist they, they seem to be these qualities in our experience, you know, the feeling of pain or the itchiness of an itch, but really they don't exist. Um, but a more moderate physicalist, and I think uh, David is is in this group, proposes instead, well, no, what we what we need is a kind of brute identity. So the phenomenal qualities they really exist, you know, these qualities we find in our experience they they really exist, but they're just identical with physical processes in the brain and as just a sort of brute identity. So, and, and this is, I mean, this is where the arguments get very interesting and um, maybe get slightly more technical. I mean, let, let me try and give a, give a couple of problems, concerns with, with that strategy. I mean, one thing a lot of people say that I don't ultimately go for myself, but one thing a lot of people say is, well, look, a scientific theory is supposed to explain, right? You know, we we want to, we we look at the chemistry of water, and and this explains, you know, the superficial characteristics of water, what, the temperature at which it boils, for example. Or we we look at DNA, and we 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 learn about, you know, which genes are hereditary, and you know, we get an we get an, an explanation of that. Whereas, you know, so it's natural when it comes to consciousness, and we're thinking about these phenomenal qualities. And most people have this thought, well, I want an explanation. I want an explanation of why they exist, why they come about in the brain. And um, and then you, you answer with, oh, well, it's just a brute identity and there's nothing more to be said. And, what, you know, one 
Bond sort of feels a little bit dissatisfied by that, but feels perhaps, you know, you're not doing what science is supposed to do, which is explain. Can I interject for a moment? So could you just clarify what you mean by brute identity? So take David's example of Clark Kent and Superman. Mm. Is the idea that no matter how much one knew about Clark Kent and no matter how much one knew about Superman, once you were told that they were the same person, you just couldn't see that they were, even though you have been told they are? Yeah, I suppose... I suppose in in the case of Water and H2O or in the case of Superman and Clark Kent we don't really feel any need for a further explanation it's 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 completely satisfying to be told well look this is just the same person you know and and you you're completely satisfied but uh when you're just told as, as a matter of sort of brute fact that these qualities we find in our experience are identical with um these brain states you can prod and poke in the brain in principle, although it's a bit dangerous. You know, you feel like something more needs to be explained here. We don't seem to have an adequate explanation. I mean, so it, it seems disanalogous. Let me put it another way. It, it's disanalogous to the case of water and H2O. It seems like when we learn that water is H2O, we get an explanation of the superficial characteristics of water. When we learn that, well, like the hackneyed example I just uh, philosophers always give is, pain and c fibers firing where c fibers firing is supposed to be some brain state that is identical it's actually empirically implausible but it's just become the kind of standard example so when we're told that the feeling of pain just is uh c fibers firing we don't seem to be getting any kind of explanation there okay you said two things in there first of all you said it seems disanalogous and then you said it is disanalogous i agree with you that it seems disanalogous but I disagree that it is disanalogous. So I think we need to distinguish here between intuitions and arguments. I can see right. I can see to you that there's a strong intuition that the, as you put it, brute identity claim leaves something unexplained. And I want to come back to that, but let's put that to one side and let's see whether there's any arguments as opposed to intuitions about the inadequacy of the brute identity claim. So you said the trouble with the brute identity claim is that we fail to explain something. We don't, for instance, as in the water H2O case, uh, in that case you say knowing that water is H2O explains the temperature melting point and so on, right. and the mel- melting point of, of ice and the boiling point of water and so on. Uh, I don't see there's any disanalogy here. The identity of pains with C fibers firing, to stick with that, with that uh, example, will explain a lot of things. It will explain why pains are caused by cuts to your skin. It will explain why aspirins make pains go away and so on. It looks exactly analogous. It's true that uh, we don't explain the identity, but I don't think identities are something that need explaining. If somebody comes along and says, why is water H2O? Why is Clark Kent Superman? That sounds like a funny question. I mean, you might say, why do you think that water is H2O? How did you find out that water is H2O? Once you've discovered that it is one and the same thing, then it just seems a strange thing to say. Why is it itself? Why is something itself? Well, it just it just is. So as far as explanation goes, I don't see there's anything left unexplained, so I don't see that you have an argument against the positing the brute identity. But let, let, me, let me now say, mm. as, I, as I agreed with you, there does seem to be a disanalogy. And I think that this is nothing to do with arguments against the identity claims. It's rather to do with the fact that People find it, and I include myself in this category of people, people find it very hard fully to embrace, to accept the claim that pains are one and the same as C-fibers firing, that a visual experience is one and the same as a brain process. And because we find it so hard to accept, we're inclined to slip into dualist thinking when we think not just are there two concepts here two names but there's two different things there's the brain process and then the puff of smoke and then we start wanting to understand why does the brain process give rise to the puff of smoke but that's all a mistaken set of questions engendered 
by the strong intuition, the intuition of dualism, that there's two things here. Once you really accept that there's one thing here, then these requests for explanation will go away. So the only puzzle I'm left with is why is it so hard for us to accept that pains are one and the same as C-fibers firing, and we don't simply find it hard to accept that Clark Kent is Superman or that water is H2O. Now, that seems to me a very interesting psychological, sociological question hmm. to which I can offer quite a lot of uh, interesting suggestions that maybe I should pause at this point. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm not entirely disagreeing with you up to now. I think, you know, I, I was partly playing devil's advocate with that demand for explanation stuff. I'm, I'm sort of actually, you know, it's, this is the talk of the explanatory gap. Um, and this is supposed to be, you know, one way of thinking about the hard problem is there seems to be this demand for explanation that physical science can't meet. But actually... Perhaps this is a bit unusual for a physicist. I know this David Chalmers disagrees with me. I'm kind of sympathetic to your this this claim that identities don't need explaining. I mean, I think so. I mean, let me let me try let me try and get to the heart of of what I think is wrong with your position. And um, you know, I've I've delayed that because I guess the matters start to get a little bit complicated. But let me let me try and um, get to the heart of it. I think to to make your position work out. What you've got to hold, really, is that introspectively, we have no knowledge of the nature of phenomenal qualities. Intros to put it to say, introspection yields no knowledge of the nature of phenomenal qualities. Um, so when, when we think about phenomenal qualities in this distinctive way we've been talking about, we're just sort of blindly pointing at something, a bit like you might point at someone in a bar you know you don't know you just that guy over there you just point at them you know you don't know anything about them you're not referring to them under a description you're just pointing you know, it could turn out to be anybody it could turn out to be not a person maybe it's the hat stand or something um i just thought of that now um so i think for your view to work out uh our introspective thought about phenomenal qualities has to be a bit like that you know so i'm thinking about my pain and I attend to my pain and I think about it in terms of how it feels. On your view, I'm just sort of blindly pointing at something. And, uh, you know, it turns out to be a brain state. Okay. And that kind of makes sense. You know, if I don't know what I'm pointing at, sure, it, it could turn out to be a brain state. Who knows? Uh, but I, th I mean, I think that has to be the view because if introspection reveals something of the nature of phenomenal qualities then it's reasonable to, to want that nature explained, its existence explained. So for your view to, to work out, it's got to be this kind of blind pointing. And I just think that's such an implausible view of our thought about phenomenal qualities. I mean, just to start putting it intuitively, if I, if I think about my pain, you know, so I've got this terrible agony and I'm you know, reflecting on how it feels. I know, I do know its nature. I know it's a feeling. And I know how it feels, and it just is a feeling, and so in, I know, and I know what it feels like, and so I know what it is for someone to feel that way. Now that's why I wouldn't want anyone else to feel it, because you know it's horrible. I know what it is to feel that way, and uh, you know, perhaps more concretely, we can we can point to um, rich knowledge of necessary similarities between our experiences, our phenomenal qualities. For example, the experience of red is similar to the experience of orange. So I think that's that's difficult to make sense of if you have just this kind of blind pointing model. So mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. why so the debate's already getting quite you know complicated here. But but that's ultimately what my objection to this view. You really need to have a a pretty implausible view of um, our epistemological relationship to our own conscious experience. Good. So Philip, I think you're doing yourself a disservice here. <laughs> I think your way of articulating what's wrong with the physicalist view isn't difficult and technical. I think it's much cleaner and neater than the knowledge mm -hmm. argument. And I don't think the knowledge argument and associated uh, views about two-dimensional semantics and so on do any work at all until they get to uh, using the line of thought you just articulated. So put it like, put it like this. 
Your view is that when we're thinking about conscious states like pains and visual experiences, as I put it in the everyday phenomenal way in terms of what they're like, the, right. the non-scientific way, the kind of intuitive direct way, when we're thinking in that way, the nature of those states is revealed to us. And somebody like me is going to have to deny that. And that seems to me a very right. interesting crux here. Now, you, you put it, I think, more strongly than you need to. You, you or you were a bit unfair to my side. You said that my side will have to say it's a kind of blind pointing. i am just uh, got a name for pains, but I don't, in virtue of that, know anything about them. I mm. deny that. I, mean, I, I, I know it's a pain. I know it hurts. I know what it's like. Uh, I might indeed uh, know that it's the opposite of pleasure when it comes to colors. I might know, just in virtue of having my phenomenal concepts, that orange is between red and yellow, stuff like that. But on my view, there's something about the nature of those states that I don't know using these kind of introspective phenomenal concepts. I don't know what's essential to them, that they're brain states. And on your view, that seems mm -hmm. inconsistent with the nature of this phenomenal thinking. You think this phenomenal thinking reveals all the essential features of the, of the, the experiences, and therefore, if they were brain states, it ought to reveal that they're brain states. Uh, and so given that these, this way of thinking is, is revelatory, uh, we can infer that these states aren't brain states. But I will just deny that. I'll say, sure, these, this way of thinking tells us what's going on with us and maybe tells us a bit about its nature, but it leaves out a crucial part of the nature of the experiences that they're one and the same with brain states. And I don't see why I have to accept your assumption that the introspective mm -hmm. phenomenal way of thinking is going to reveal all the essential features of uh, the phenomenal properties that it refers to. Yeah. Um, I mean, just one point which I don't, I don't think we disagree on. I mean, you said the knowledge argument isn't really what's at issue. I mean, I think it is in a sense in, I mean, we're already at a, quite a complicated argument that, that depends on a lot of agreement that, the, you know, that the knowledge argument yeah. does show that there are these two different concepts and, I think the knowledge argument is hugely important to to get to that uh, stage. I, I, I agree about you that. You know, I mean, I think, a, and as I say, it's quite frustrating that a, a lot of the public discourse on the hard problem, these people do TED Talks saying, hey, I've solved the hard problem. And then you're waiting for the, what they think of the knowledge argument and they haven't even heard of it. You know, so, I mean, I think the knowledge argument is is important to 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 get get the hard problem going and um, one needs to have a kind of response to that. And, um, but anyway, let's come back to the disagreement. So you're saying, so part of what you're saying, well, you don't have to say that it's a completely, as I said, a completely blind concept. You know, you can know something about, I mean, well, one thing you said is you can know it's a pain. I'm not sure that's, I mean, that's just like if I, I point at a guy in the pub, say that guy, and then I, well, I know that that guy is that guy. I mean, that's sort of trivial because i'm just reusing the label so i'm not sure that i know it's a pain uh if, if if that's just reusing the kind of blind pointing concept uh does very much but then you said you know you can know it's dissimilar to pleasure or it's not pleasure or i guess i guess you'd want to agree with me maybe that it's you know you know that red resemble red experiences resemble orange experiences okay so then so so now and things do start to get complicated my I, what I say is, would well, tell me more about your theory of these concepts, how they fix reference, you know, how they fix reference in such a way that we know some necessary features of these, uh, but but we but uh, but we don't know others, and um, and how I mean I think there are other in peculiar features of our epistemological situation with respect to phenomenal qualities. We have a certain kind of something close to certainty maybe i'm not going to say absolute certainty but there's a certain kind of special justification we have with respect to our own phenomenal qualities that we don't have for example with respect to external world if i'm in pain i know that i'm in pain with a much greater degree of certainty than i do that there's a table here right it's very easy to 
get in a kind of skeptical frame of mind and think, you know, maybe I'm in the matrix, maybe the table doesn't exist. Very hard to do that with your own pain. If you're in agony, maybe I'm not really in agony. Maybe the, the evil computers are just making me think I'm in agony. That's maybe, maybe it's possible. I'm not saying, you know, 100% certainty, but it's much, it's, it seems like the kind of justification that's much closer to the justification we have in logic and mathematics, you know, that maybe, you know, Descartes tries to think about whether we could be wrong that two plus two is four, you know, maybe the evil computers are making us think it's two plus two is four and really it's five. But it's, so there's this very special justification. So really, and this is where the, I mean, this is what I try to do in, in my book, for example, is, you know, look, you, okay, physicalist, you've got to tell me, you've got to give me a theory of, well, let's just say the term phenomenal concepts, right? This is the, the term for these special um, concepts we use to think about our phenomenal qualities that um, that David and I both think exist. It's just he thinks they refer to physical states. I don't think they do. So, so my challenge is, well, physicalist, you know, you tell me a theory of phenomenal concepts that accounts for all these things that... Um, that the, the, the knowledge we have of certain necessary features of experiences, like red ones resemble orange ones, the special kind of certainty we have mm. about uh, our own experience. And I've just never seen a physicalist theory getting anywhere near that. And I try, I mean, this is, okay, okay. I, I try about to go through all the possibilities and, and uh, none of them really work out. But so that, that, that's, so that's, yeah, that's, it's, I, I've, it's actually interesting how much we agree, right? That it, it gets to this stage, you know, mm. of can the physicalist give an adequate account of these phenomenal concepts? That's really where the, the cutting edge, in my mind, the cutting edge of the problem of consciousness is right now. Yeah, I wonder if you're not digging a big hole for yourself here. <laughs> uh, but just to go right back to the, the, the first point you made there about the, the knowledge argument, I agree that all the debate we're having here hinges on how we're going to understand the workings of phenomenal concepts. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the knowledge argument, Frank Jackson's knowledge argument, the, the Mary in the black and white room argument back in the right. 70s. Was it the 70s? Uh, 80s. 80s. 80s, 19, 80s uh, 1982. Yeah, also, my, my colleague Howard Robinson in, in, um, yeah. in the same year made the same argument. Whereas Very good. Anyway. Frank Jackson's argument caught on. But <laughs> Sorry, just quick that was an argument that forced philosophers to attend to the fact that we have these special ways of thinking about our experiences in terms, as I put it, in terms of what they like, the kind of introspective way of thinking. And, and the, the issue here hinges on, right. on what are we to make of this way of thinking. So you said, come on, David, explain how these concepts work in such a way that they give us a very high degree of assurance about what's going on in us, uh, tell us about things like uh, orange is similar to red, but don't tell us about everything about the experiences, and in particular don't tell us that they're brain states. Well, I don't see why that's such a big problem. I mean, there is the phenomenon of self-knowledge. People know about some of the things going on inside them with a pretty high degree of assurance and in a way that makes them much better placed to be authorities on what's going on inside them than other people. I can know whether I'm in pain in a way that you, you can't. But there are plenty of perfectly sensible, naturalistic, physicalist theories about how that kind of thing works. Uh, and... None of them would have the implication that because you can know some things about your experiences introspectively, you're therefore guaranteed to know everything about your experiences introspectively. Introspection does not tell you about neural workings. Now, now, uh, so I don't see why I shouldn't be able to answer the challenge that you posed. Give me an account of how introspective thinking working, such that it reveals some things about what's going on inside you, but not others. But now I put the obvious challenge to you. Come on, you give me an account of phenomenal <laughs> concepts or indeed any kind of thinking which is of such a nature that it's guaranteed to reveal to you all the essential features of its reference. I cannot think, and I was thinking about this as I was coming here, I cannot think 
of any respectable way to make such a mental faculty plausible? Why should there be anything which just by its exercise reveals mm. everything about what it's focused on? Well, I didn't really, just on the first point before I address that challenge, I mean, I didn't really hear an answer there of, of, of the special kind of certainty we have. I mean, you said there's a certain way of thinking about our experiences. You know, I think I can think about my pain in a way you can't think about my pain, but I didn't hear an account of the special kind of why the, why, why the, I have the sort of certainty that I'm in pain that um, something approaching the certainty we have in logic and mathematics. And, you know, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, we don't want to get into details, but okay. I mean, I, I seem to remember five minutes ago your qualifying what you were saying by saying well maybe it's not quite absolute certainty mm -hmm. but put that to one one side uh, look uh yeah same as we have in logic what, in what about the kind of certainty i mean there's cases and cases there's lots of theories there's a complicated literature here what about the kind of certainty that comes from cartesian cogito thoughts uh i can't doubt that I'm thinking because in the course of thinking that I'm doing some thinking, okay? I can't doubt that I'm in pain. I can't doubt that I'm having this pain because in course of articulating that thought, you include the actual pain right, in right. the thought. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, that, that's one line of mm -hmm. uh, analysis that would deliver the kind of special certainty that you are after. I mean, I don't see there's any difficulty for a physicalist to offer yeah. those, those kinds of stories. Sure. Yeah, well, I, so the way I present it in my book, actually, I mean, I think there's a, there's a kind of dilemma here. I think th the best approach for the, um, for the physicalist to account for the certainty or close to certainty is something like the line you're giving. But then if you think reference, the reference of phenomenal concepts is determined in that way, then it's hard to see how they can yield these information, for example, about resemblances. Now, on the other hand, the other horn of the dilemma, we have uh, views by physicalists like uh, Janet Levin and um, Robert Schroer, whose view I quite like, where, where phenomenal concepts are partially descriptive. So they, they, they're they not blind pointers. They fix reference with description. Uh, so, you know, part of the reference-fixing description of phenomenal red is that it resembles phenomenal orange but then if you have that kind of view reference becomes very precarious you know it could be that the brain states don't have that resemblance property and then reference fails and i'm not actually experiencing phenomenal orange so I i've never heard a view that can account for both of these things because if you, if you want the kind of um you know we learn information about our brain states uh, sorry and information about our experiences introspectively you need something kind of descriptive um but if you want, but that's no good for certainty. I'm repeating myself, but that's the sort of dilemma I see existing. I don't quite understand why we're hmm. playing this game, or why you're inviting me to play this game. No, I issued a challenge a moment ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, we 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 could start looking for explanations that would uh, uh, be consistent with my physicalist commitments. Mm -hmm. But how's the story going to go on your side? It sounds like you're going to have. Okay some story that's going to explain all the things, powers of introspective uh, uh, thinking that are supposed to be difficult for me, and what's more, explain how introspective thinking is guaranteed to reveal everything right. about mm -hmm. its focus. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like we're just going to invoke magic here. And uh, uh -huh. so we have to recognize <laughs> introspective thinking isn't something physicalistically explainable. It's just magic. And because it's magic, it shows us everything. I mean, I, 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 right, I don't quite right. see why you're supposed to be on better ground than me here. Right. This is reminding me of an argument we had in Helsinki at three in the morning. And, but anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so just for the record, you, you haven't answered the challenge, but you, you're claiming I haven't either. So, right. And um, the challenge is worse for you. Right. So, well... My starting point is that, I mean, I, I go for the, the venerable tradition, uh, British empiricists, Russell, um, that we, are, we have a very special acquaintance relationship with our um, phenomenal qualities, such that the, their nature is, is directly revealed to us in having them, um, in having them and thinking about them. Um, 
and and I cl- so I would suggest that that's that's it's pretty intuitive. It's pretty intuitive um, on reflection that when you attend to your pain and you think about it in terms of how it feels, its nature is directly revealed to you. It's a feeling, and you're apprehending how it feels. I mean, what more could there be? So. So, so I say it's intuitive, but that's not, I mean, you know, say it's intuitive, it's not a knockdown argument. But then I would say um, it's the best explanation of the um, features of our epistemological relationship with consciousness that, I, that we've been talking about this, you know, the, the, the knowledge of necessary features and the special kind of certainty. So it's sort of, so the argument is kind of, it's sort of an argument to best exclamation. It's, it's intuitive, acquaintance is intuitive. And if we accept that things are intuitively as they seem to be, then we get an explanation of these uh, features of the epistemology of consciousness. So um, it's maybe a little bit like maybe an argument for the external world. You know, there seems to be an external world. And if we accept in this respect that things are as they seem, we get a, we get um, we get an explanation of the regularities in our experience. So yeah, so that's so, so. Let me just respond to your other point. But then so I think at then at this stage you say, well, what this this is magic. This is a crazy hmm. and reminding me of our Helsinki argument. But uh, um, can't, you know, can't say I remember I, I would that argument. Say, but, uh, and, you know, uh, we had had a, a number of drinks. Um, what number? So oh, I, was that but, the night where we discovered the stuff that was like like uh, alcoholic bitter lemon cream soda? <laughs> that, that it was a Possibly. a special a special Finnish alcoholic drink Possibly. invented for the 1952 Olympics. And uh, <laughs> anyway, carry I don't on. Remember that detail? I just remember you yeah, berating me on the on the streets of Helsinki. It's magic. You believe in magic? Anyway, but so so let me try and respond to this charge that I believe in magic. I mean, I, I would say. The acquaintance hypothesis sounds magical from a physicalist perspective once we already assume physicalism. You know, from that starting point that, you know, it doesn't look like um, any kind of physically kosher theory of reference is going to be able to account for this. But that's sort of begging the question. I mean, what I, I think, well, I haven't got onto my view, but I mean, I, I think the view I have is, a, is, is gives a perfectly adequate account of consciousness, avoids all these worries, can handle acquaintance. Uh, doesn't have any problems with causal closure, and um, yeah. So, so I think, so I think it's only what I'm. The acquaintance stuff is only magical from a physicalist perspective. But that's you know, can, can I press you a little issue. bit on on that? I hadn't really thought about this before, but I think I'd like to. As you said, we haven't got onto your your view yet, but it's not quite clear to me how your view is going to underpin this kind of direct acquaintance faculty that that when we're introspecting we're directly acquainted mm-hmm. with all sides of the the our phenomenal life uh, all the nature all the essential properties of experiences mm-hmm. and what's worrying me is that your views are kind of Russellian monist panpsychist we might talk about that in in a minute but while that turns things around a bit it doesn't really try and disengage from a physical account of what's going on in mm. in reality. It, it takes reality to have all the, the structure that physics says it has and uh, says a little bit more about the nature that 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 uh, breathes breathes uh, substance into that into that structure. But given that your uh, understanding of the structure of the natural world is just the same as the physicalists. It seems to me that you owe some more account of how this uh, direct acquaintance is supposed to work. There's supposed to be something ourselves that are directly acquainted with another thing, the experiences, presumably ourselves are capable of forming thoughts and judgments and articulating those thoughts and judgments in words and the experiences are something different from the thoughts and it looks like uh, you've got to give an account of the mechanisms that lead from the experiences to the thoughts to the descriptions of the thoughts and words and it's not quite clear to me how you're going to guarantee that this mechanism is going to ensure that everything about the experiences 
is revealed to thought. I'm not entirely sure I'm seeing what the problem is. I mean, one thing you said at the end was you have to ensure the mechanisms uh, underpin acquaintance. But I mean, the view wouldn't be that acquaintance works by um, some kind of mechanism. And the view is there's some kind of there's direct acquaintance, direct revelation of the nature of the property so so i'm not sure it needs some kind of mechanical underpinning okay maybe there's a question here about how if there is this feature of reality that um material beings have this acquaintance relationship how does that fit in with what we know about the the structural features of reality sounds like an interesting chat i'm not not quite immediately sure why there's any i mean there's a general problem with rosselia modism about you know how how consciousness fits in with the structural features of the physical world. You know, I mean, one point people point to the structure, that, you know, the structure of consciousness maybe doesn't seem to fit with the structure of the physical world. Maybe what you're pointing to is a version of that. So maybe there are some some problems here. But, I mean, you know, for, for the, from the Rossellian Monis perspective, you know, it's a question of starting points, I think. You know, the starting point is, well, look, this consciousness is this thing we have good reason to think uh, exists and that we apprehend its nature when we reflect upon it and its nature seems to involve these features of acquaintance or, or you know making sense of our epistemological relationship with it involves that so that's that, that's that's the starting point and then um you know maybe you can prove that there's some inconsistency with what we know about the structural features of 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 the physical world but um i'm not quite hearing that yet so you both just mentioned this thing uh, Rossellian monism. So should we clarify for the listener what this is? Yeah, so this is a view that's a new approach to consciousness that's attracting a lot of interest and excitement even in the philosophical literature. So, I mean, I say it's new, but it's 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 actually inspired by certain writings of from the 1920s of philosopher Bertrand Russell and and also the, the scientist, Arthur Eddington, who's the, the first scientist to confirm general relativity, talked about the, the, these philosophical issues in his Gifford lectures in 1928, I think. They had a kind of really novel approach to the mind-body problem that sort of got completely forgotten about for much of the latter half of the 20th century, is now being rediscovered in this view that's become known as Rossellian monism. So the, the starting point is the idea that Physics tells you less than you think about matter. So I think in the public mind, physics is on its way to giving us this complete description of the universe, of the nature of space, time and matter. You know, we're not there yet. We've got to work out how general relativity fits with quantum mechanics and so on. But, you know, one day the physicists are going to produce this grand unified theory of everything and that'll just be the complete story of the nature of space time and matter but i think so what what russell and eddington realize is that the problem is that when you reflect upon the kind of information physical science gives to us about matter you discover that actually physical science just characterizes matter exclusively in terms of what it does in terms of its behavior so if you think about i mean think about an electron what does physics tell us about an electron? It has mass. It has negative charge. How does physics characterize these features? You know, very, very roughly, mass is characterized in terms of um, attraction between with other massive things, gravity, and um, resisting acceleration. So this is what mass does. You know how how things with mass behave. Or negative charge, negative charge things repel other negative charge things and attract positive charge things again this is about the behavior of the electron and so when you reflect upon all the properties uh, physical science describes the matter it's wholly a matter of how the thing behaves what it does but intuitively that the, there must be more to what the electron is than what it does the electron must have what philosophers call an intrinsic nature there must be somehow it is in and of itself so to take a kind of analogy to try and make that clearer you know, if you imagine a, you've got a kind of concrete chess piece, the knight, concrete chess piece on a board, you know, suppose you, you know what it does, you know that it moves in a sort of L-shaped. Still, there's more to learn about it. it must, the chess piece has some kind of intrinsic nature. Maybe it's made of plastic, maybe it's made of wood, 
maybe it's made of metal. And similarly, even after we know from physics what the electron does, how it behaves, intuitively there must be some way it is in and of itself, and, and physical science is completely silent on this matter. So I, I call this the, the austerity thesis, that, um, phys and, and this goes all the way up the physical sciences with chemistry, neuroscience, neuroscience characterizes brain states in terms of what they do, their, their causal role with respect to sensory inputs and behavioral outputs. So, so all the way through physical science, this is a huge gap in the picture of the world we're getting from physical science. Physical science tells us nothing about the intrinsic nature of matter. So, so how does this help with consciousness? Well, so come back to I don't know, the, the, the problem of consciousness, the hard problem. You know, roughly think it's the question of where the phenomenal qualities are in the brain. How do we locate the phenomenal qualities in the brain? Uh, but now when we reflect on what I call the austerity thesis, we realize well, there's another problem. You know, what is the intrinsic nature of the brain? We, we don't know from neuroscience or physics what the intrinsic nature of the brain is. And so the Rossellian monist thought is, well, let's solve both these problems at once. And we say that phenomenal qualities are, at least in part, the intrinsic nature of the brain, or more specifically, the, the physical processes in the brain. So the idea is that um, neuroscience characterizes physical brain processes extrinsically in terms of what they do, their causal role in the body, in the brain. But in terms of their intrinsic nature, how they are in themselves, they're forms of consciousness, they're feelings, sensations, phenomenal qualities. So I think that, you know, this gives us a beautiful way of unifying mind and matter, giving a non-dualistic, unified picture of the world. Uh, gives you everything you want from physicalism, but without the difficulties of kind of a consciousness. So, um, you know, it really seems a lot of people are seeing it as a, a very, you know, very hopeful way forward on consciousness. So, yeah, so that's the rough idea. Thanks, Philip. That was very, very uh, clear, very interesting. Uh, shall I say what I, uh, what I think about that? Uh, Go ahead. Please do. So... The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. If you're yet to subscribe to the Pan Psycast on iTunes, please do so. For more information on anything to do with the show or what we've discussed today, please visit www.thepansycast.com.